Hi, I'm Abhinay Jain and you're listening to The Garage Story. In this podcast, we speak to startup founders about their zero to one uh, zero to one journey, those first initial messy steps of turning an idea into reality. Powered by Clutter for Startups, we are all about real, unfiltered stories of grit, growth, and everything in between. And I'm really excited to have this conversation today with Nivio. He's based out of Germany, Europe. They are building something very, very interesting. Uh, it is of my interest as well. Uh, because they are doing something for kids, something to do with screen time. And I'm I'm really excited to have this conversation. Hi, Nivio. How are you doing today? Hi, Abhinay. Thank you for the invite. I'm doing good. And yeah, happy to join this podcast and talk to you about everything unfiltered that a young founder can share with, I hope, many other founders out there. Yeah, definitely. So first of all, uh, first thing first. Uh, would like to know what is Daydream, right? Do you call it Daydream or Tales of Mellow? What's what's the startup uh, and what do you do here? Yeah, um, so uh, dear, I could take a long time to explain what we do in detail, but I would try to package it in a, in a, a bigger nutshell. So um, the, the, the simple answer would be we are an ad tech company in the first place. So we are focusing on educational solutions, um, focused on parents. So we really want to build solutions that will help parents and the ecosystem of parents in their daily lives, whatever it be, but always with the focus to have a positive impact on kids. As a company, so if you would now analyze the company, we are something like a high-tech publishing company. So um, thinking about how can we um, connect all these new cutting-edge technologies like AI, uh, machine learning, and, uh, and all these kind of things, uh, connect it with humans, so create this human-in-the-loop process and become something like the fastest producing publishing company for books and audiobooks just on a personalized and interactive level so something like disney plus just for books and audiobooks nice very nice so you will be doing a lot of things the i'm still thinking is it do you call it daydreams and is tales of mellow just one of the product the company is daydreams and uh, uh, pro product is tales of mellow which is the number one product you are coming with out with or is the startup tales of mellow how is that naming uh, for you yeah, exactly. So we, the company, so the legal company is called Daydream um, okay. because Daydream is going also, as I said, uh, we are building a lot of these kind of legal partnerships with brands and existing publishing companies. And then Daydream is something like the more simple way to be something like this publishing high tech at tech company. And Tales of Mellow is the, is the brand name of one of our platforms, which is the first product, which I mentioned, where kids can build these kind of super highly interactive and highly personalized books and audiobooks for themselves. God. And yes, you answered it already. There will be in the future, we are planning new uh, vertical expansions with additional products that are extending the, the first platform or that will be just something like a different niche, for example, for babies or for just parents or whatever it can be. Right, right, right. So that makes uh, sense. Uh, I think that's how every, you know, a lot of this company which is go, who are going to publish a lot of games or for that matter, ed tech products, right? Uh, mm -hmm. They start with. I know a little bit about you. I'll hold on to that. Uh, I would like to know the co-founders that you have, the founding team, team that you have. When did you guys start? How did you all meet? I also know it's a very unique setup that you have. So before we go deeper into the startup, I would like you to talk about the founding team. How did you guys meet the setup you have uh, and how is it working for you there? Yes, very good question. Um, look, we have five founders um, and we all uh, have been founders in the, in, in the past as well. So one of, uh, of the guys already uh, did one very successful exit, is currently preparing his second one. So um, we came from the industry, mostly all of us came from this, from this world of entrepreneurship. Um, the, the cool thing is in the previous ventures that we did, we learned a lot and we learned especially what should you avoid when finding the right founder. So this is one of the most critical things, I think, find the right person who will be the one who, who will trust you, who you need to trust, where you will break the bread. And uh, what has connected us was that we all had our businesses, but somehow already had some kind of correlation between the different businesses. And we just identified, man, you're so good in what you do and you're always committed and you're always in time. I would love to work more with you. And then somehow I had this Heureka moment where I had the idea and then just started thinking about, okay, do, who is the person that I know being super good in technology? Who is the guy or the person who is very good in design? 
And then I connected these people with the concept and we all f fall in love with it. And here we are now. Uh, what is also connecting us, I think, um, which gives this a little bit more of these kind of chains that are binding us together, is um, one of my co-founders, also a family member of mine, one of my cousins. Um, and it, this is a little bit also the historical thing. So we are a German creation company. So we have, um, we have roots in both of these countries. And uh, I'm a Croatian guy who's raised, who raised up in Germany uh, because my parents had came here with me as a toddler uh, because the war in Croatia hit it in. So we had to became as refugees to Germany. And my cousin sat there with his family. And for us, this is something like these emotional family thing that we are now after so many years of digital collaboration, now finding something together, which is something like our project, which is connecting us even more. Yeah, so, and this is, I think, uh, the root cause of all the commitment and the passion that we are putting into this project. Got it. So five co-founders, mm -hmm. when, when did you get the idea of starting something like this, uh, which year, and uh, maybe take us through the initial days, right? You know, was it when you were already in job? Uh, how was it uh, from idea to, you know, in which timelines? Yeah, um, the initial idea came, I, I think it was end of 2020. Uh, okay. 2022, sorry. Okay. So um, during that time, I was um, working for a company, uh, for, for a um, Silicon Valley company um, that started expanding to Central Europe. And I was one of the first hires for, for the Central European market. And this company was a pioneer and market leader in the AI and especially in this um, LLM space. So for me, this was a very quick segue from analytics where I was working all the years before that into yeah. LLMs and AI. And then I started to, I mean, you, for every new job, you start to learn, to build yourself, to grow your mind. And I really was super fascinated by everything. And I mean, this was the time even before ChatGPT, and then it became super popular. So um, I already had this correlation to the topic. And um, as I said, I'm a dad myself. I have three kids. And uh, we are a traditional book reading family. So my kids love in the evening to take a book together to read something and interact. And uh, I just recognized somehow for myself, it's, it's, it's hard challenging to always have new things and always have new books and um, creating a story out of your mind is always not that easy after a 10, 11 hour shift in the tech industry. So how could I somehow make it more interactive for my kids, more personalized so that there is just a bigger journey for them? And uh, then I started to prototype my first little things with existing technologies. And um, then I had this Heureka moment. Wow, this would be fantastic because I recognize the, the shine in the eyes of my kids and that they love it and that they are chasing me. Dad, can we have one more and one more? And uh, then the rest was magic. I just called, uh, as I said, one of the best designers I ever met personally and one of uh, these technical co-founders of us and asked them, hey, guys, do you think we can build something like this? Give us two weeks was the feedback. And in two weeks, we had something like a very, very early stage prototype which we could test and we said, okay, this is fantastic. <laughs> so, awesome. and then so it started. I hear you right. Uh, the need came from the fact that you are a dad and I can relate as well. So once you are dad, you have your own small, small problem. It's not like big problem, but yeah, I can understand. Uh, reading a story, you make up those stories, but sometimes you are lost, not how to create. I, I also feel the same, right? So you did that, but that time you were in your job or you had already moved out. How was it? You're in, with, in a job, right? Yes, uh, I was in a job back then. So, and um, I continued with this job also uh, for, I think, 14 months after the initial, uh, so the moment where we had the idea until the moment where I said, okay, it's, I think it's now time to leave my job. So this was something like a 14 months period. Super. I love my job. And on so, 2023, sometime you, you moved out of the job, right? So my, my next question actually, which is very critical, right? Mm -hmm. Which is more critical for somebody, let's say I'm assuming for somebody who has family, maybe mid-career, I would say, right? When you have, and also you have been into technology space, done really well. I was going through your, uh, the brands you have worked with in Europe, right? You have, you have done really good job. Also in past, you have uh, done a startup uh, yourself, mm -hmm. right? You have been an entrepreneur. So how did you convince that, hey, there is some kind of, you know, job brings you come, some comfort and startups gives you that you know while it has it has its own high but it is sometimes out of your comfort zone there is uncertainty right how did you convince yourself that okay this is so good that you know i want to take it full time how did you do that 
So to be super honest and transparent and human, there have been many sleepless nights um, before I unplugged myself out of these security and parachute, um, which was my corporate career. Um, and I also think for all the other founders. So we are still young. We are in the midst of these kind of career building thing. Now you have family. So the financial pressure is even higher, totally honest. Um, but there is one thing in life that I just learned. Um, you can have a career, you can make a fantastic job and get crazy salaries and all these things. But uh, it will not always close this gap. I think humans, we as a human species, um, for since we exist, we are builders. We build the things. And um, uh, I think it's something like a, a natural core that we all have in us, that we want to build something. And uh, this was something that in, in myself, it started to become very big and bigger. And the noise in, in, in my head became bigger and the passion for it. And then if you can connect this, this demand to, to create with something what, that gives you this emotional trust um, or an impact or what I said, even in the end, it felt like a duty. So for me, it became a duty to say, this is a real problem there and I can solve it. If I don't do it, who knows who will do it and how he will solve it. And then we don't know if, if it really was solved. So it's my opportunity to now close this problem for many, many millions of families outside there and help. And of course, there is always this bittersweet thing. It's a lot of investment. It's a lot of risk. But if everything turns out, ideally, you provide it for yourself, for your family, for many other people that are working for you or with you. And um, then I think you can really segue into something like a very confident life mode. I hope it. No, no, totally. I, now I, I totally hear you, the purpose behind doing something. Once you have seen and you you get the each, right? That, hey, mm -hmm. I this is something interesting. Could be big, right? And if you do it, maybe you will have some sleepless night. But if you do not do it, then also you are going to have many sleepless nights that I did not pursue, right? That that regret can be something really big. And if you find the purpose, it makes sense, right? So, so in fact, that's one conversation whenever any founder, right, you talk to, it kind of becomes common that they really love the purpose. They they, they could see that this is something I need to do and then they go ahead, right? Exactly. A couple of things here mm. now you had the idea and uh, you had a great connection you have worked and you knew the best guys in tech in engineering and design and everything right you could quickly get a founding team in place okay you did some kind of iteration around and you would have done some early research right to validate i know you emerged from your own house that i need this but you would have done some research right Mm -hmm. Can you take me through how did you do that research? Maybe those 14 months before the idea and you actually doing it. How mm -hmm. did you go about the research? Was it very formal? Was it just verbatim? If you can help and which one and, and maybe some ideas around this you did and that gave you the real confidence that uh, mm -hmm. this is going to work. Yeah. So um, I, as I said, everything started with the personal um, recognition. Okay, there is something that I feel myself. And I identify my family as something like a modern family nowadays in Central Europe. Um, and uh, of course, if you are a family with three kids, most of your friends are people with kids as well. So, and when you then start to identify the problem, isolate it so that you can position it to people. And then you start to introduce this, this new idea and this problem that you have recognized to others. Um, then you start recognizing, okay, is there a pattern? And this was what happened to me. So I started, of course, in my inner circle. So my friends and families and talking to them, talking to their friends and then understanding, okay, we all share the same challenges. So it's not just me. And then you start to big, make, so this is what I did. So I did then some like a very generalistic research, which means I started to break down the challenge, which was, okay, do parents have, are, are parents nowadays different than parents generations before us? Do we have other challenges? Is screen time one of these challenges? So these have been all the questions. And then I recognized, okay, what is the difference from uh, back then to now? And we did the research. So we analyzed trends. So we checked trends of screen time, for example, for children. We analyzed working behavior of parents a couple of years ago and now. And then you recognize, okay, there is a lot of movement. And um, there are three numbers that gave me the confidence. Okay, this is a real thing. Yeah. Uh, the first thing was the, the development of the percentage of how many 
uh, households with children under 12 years do have two parents in full-time work. Okay, mm -hmm. so this number in the last five years increased from 50% to 70%. So a heavy increase. 40% wow. um, more people are now as a family in full-time jobs than, than just four or five years ago. And in the same period, we recognize, okay, um, the same generation, the same group of people that participated in this research, and this was an international research with the top 40 economies of the world, um, says, okay, so 95 for 94% of them said, okay, reading is relevant for us. And reading and um, enablement of our kids in this direction is relevant for us. And I said, okay, that's interesting because this is a conflict. And at the same time, you just take a last, last uh, review, which is the screen time development of children. And I recognize, wow, that's crazy. Because in the same five years, the screen time of kids has grown by more than 320%. How much? So for me, 320%. Wow. I mean, I, I expected it to be huge, but no. uh, I wasn't expecting that much. Oh, wow. 320% within five years. And um, most of it, and um, then, then I started to build this hypothesis. Okay, so we are a new generation of families, moms and dads. Um, we are more committed to work because we need to. The financial pressure is higher. I mean, just in Germany, and I mean, this is maybe also in US and India and everywhere, uh, the average living costs, so for rents, for food, have grown in the last three years by 25%. Mm -hmm. So now I can ask anyone who's listening to this podcast, who of you has got a 25% sal uh, salary increase in the last three years? That's the thing. And this is the hypothesis that is forcing more people to work or have a second job or whatever. And then it's clear logically that you have a lack of energy, a lack of time, but there is still this beautiful little child at home that needs you. And uh, But parents also need the, the time for other things. So you come home, you're not directly jumping into your, yeah. I don't know, dad mode or mom mode. You also have the food to prepare, the Lord, um, so many things. Okay. And these three things connected to me say, okay, this is the research that I needed for myself to build a hypothesis that something is crazily not good and we need to help. And then we did a personal research with 100 families that we invited over social media and et cetera, where we wanted to get these one-on-one -on -one conversations. And right. this was the, the final step for me to really get these, okay, this is real. Uh, because what we found out is that from 100 participants, all 100 said, screen time is not really a problem for us, but the content is the problem. So we have... We are not happy about the content itself, what the kids consume. Okay. And if there would be something that would be healthy, I would, I would, I would uh, support it and I would be willing to even pay for it. And this was the connection that closed the gap for me. And I said, okay, then uh, let's start working. Let's start building. Got it. And so very interesting research. And I'm assuming you have put in decent amount of time for both, you know, primary, secondary, all type of research, one-on-one -on -one conversations, looking at data, applying patterns, right? How much, how's the macros of, you know, nuclear families, uh, people work, both parents working, right? And, and mm -hmm. many of these things are relatable and the screen time increasing. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, you mm -hmm. also got to know that screen time and the quality of screen time is also very, right? What is being watched is also equally important uh, for, for the parents. So you got that idea. Now mm -hmm. you were ready to kind of, the problem statement was clear. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm assuming that by this, you'd be in 2023 mid or so. Yes. Uh, you mean what we did in, in 2023? Yeah. I mean, by the time you had done this research, uh, that must have been 2023. Uh, most of mm -hmm. the time yeah. it have been 2023. Yeah, exactly. right? okay. So next step. Now you know the problem, uh, mm -hmm. but to what is the solution? What is Tales of Mellow then, right? What does it do? Uh, if you can tell me a little bit more about what uh, what happens on the product. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> the first thing that we want to do is, um, as I said, the main problem is the content itself, okay? Not the screen time. For most parents, it's just the content. So we said... Um, and then if we then analyze what is the content for you, they said unhealthy. So this was the word. And I said, okay, then, then we are talking about unhealthy screen time. Yes. And I said, okay, then it, this should be the first thing that we should do. We are banning unhealthy screen time and replacing it with healthy screen time. Okay. And then the question was, how can you get healthy screen time? And what we have done is an application that is, as I said, we, are, we want to make reading cool again. Reading, listening, learning, how to make these things cool again. 
um, it's hard because they're the biggest competitor that you have and the predator of entertainment out there is video consumption. This is dominating. So we said, <clears throat> then let's think about all the things that make a video a good video and bring this into books and bring this into audiobooks. So how can we make them interactive, um, emotional, um, or personalized? So all of these things that are now possible because we have the technologies now there. How can we make this? And this is what we did. So in Mellow, you have to think about two main concepts. The first concept is creativity. So I want to get passive consumption out of the room of okay. kids. Of kids. So um, how can you get a kid engaging and entertaining and learning while letting it be creative? So what we did is we call it the, the a brick-based story generator. So it's something like the Lego concept. All of us know Lego and the brickets. Yeah. But yeah. if you take the Lego, a, a box of Lego and put it in front of kids, they will build so many little creative things. And right. if you ask them what they have built, they will have their own story and an interpretation. And um, the variety will be huge. And if you now take these things out and make them again into unique brackets and leave the room and come back, the same kid will have a completely new figure, a new thing, with a yeah. new story. So the creativity of kids is huge. And, and we said, then let's take this beautiful Lego concept divide the, 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 the rules of literature into brickets and give kids a very simple visual and acoustically supported brick-based building funnel where they can support and build their own books and audiobooks. So something oh. like, who is the main character? Where do we go? What kind of story is it? What is the activity? And build these things together and get a fully personalized story. So this is the first thing. And the second thing is <clears throat> um, more focus on the... Um, on, on real entertainment then. So how can we connect entertainment with books and audiobooks in a very highly polished way? And here we are working like a um, like like I said, like Netflix or Amazon Prime. So we produce with authors, with illustrators, editors, uh, logopaths, teachers. So a huge supply chain with humans uh, equipped with the highest new level of technology um, to publish highly edutainment content for children. Um, beautifully books that look like Disney and Pixar videos just as books and uh, something that we produce ourselves. And at the same time, the platform on this level is also like a marketplace. So if you are a very popular Indian publishing company or German publishing company in the, in the child segment, you can come to us and we will offer you digitalization services so that we get your books that are existing into our platform in, a, in this new format with all these digital assistants that we have created so that you can offer it as premium content to you, to our audience. And then we are acting like a market marketplace where we have revenue shares, uh, of course. Um, but we also scale on one level the, uh, the amount of content that we need to provide to the users so that they are retained and have fun. Got it. So I understand now, which is the first part is children can customize, build a book with their own creativity. Uh, that's one thing. And you also have uh, now made it more accessible to a lot of the books which are widely available in offline more to to be available on the app itself and uh, uh, available to kids one mm -hmm. question is uh, are these audiobooks or do kids read it or are this finally a video how does it how do you convert something into a book uh, on mobile just uh, in a simpler way if you can explain yes so um it's a book in the first place it's a book uh, so it looks like and it feels like a book. So it's really you have these haptical um, signals from the phone that you really flip the page. So it really feels like you're acting with a real book just on a digital screen. Um, and the magic, and I think this is the, the core uh, USP that we have on the book and audiobook side, is that the books are equipped with, we call it assistants. So we have built assistants uh, that, for example, can read the story to you. So if you want to still page by page, flip the book, see the image and see the text, but you are not, you can't read or you are blind or whatever. You have different barriers. Um, then we want to solve these barriers for you. So the assistant is reading the book to you in a very beautiful voice. Um, and the second thing is, and this is hopefully getting launched in the next two months, um, and this is the biggest, biggest innovation that we will bring this year, is uh, called Mellow Explain. And Mellow Explain is, you think about it like Siri. So if, if you sit on a couch with your kid and uh, you read something to it, your kid will probably ask hundreds of questions, which is, which is good. This is what they should do. Um, if they are alone or in front of YouTube, they will not ask questions. Who should they ask? 
Yeah. And we don't want this in our system. So we said, okay, if a kid has questions, why should it not be able to say, okay, I'm reading a book of, from Cleopatra, for example, in Egypt. So why should a kid not say, uh, hey, Mello, what is a pyramid? What is a princess? So, and that Mello can explain it to you in a very simple way, appropriate in the language of your kid. So this yeah. is what we are launching in the next weeks, uh, in the next months. And um, this, that's what I say. So it's, the book and, it's a book and audio hybrid experience with a lot of these assistant functions that will give you this kind of interaction while you just consume. Understood. No, that makes a lot of sense because the insight you had was it was unhealthy content. And the reason it is unhealthy at times is because it is not interactive. They are just listening, right? And because exactly. by, by nature, right, kids have to be curious. They are new to this world. They should be asking a lot of questions. Now, when you tell me that, hey, this question will be answered, one of the challenge or the guilt we have as parents is we are not able to give enough time to answer those questions. When we have, we used to stay with, let's say, grand grandparents, etc. Right? They used to spend time or you know probably help them. But here, at least when they read a story, they can ask, and that becomes more interactive. So I'm pretty sure. Uh, obviously, it's it's a very early stage of the product development. I'm pretty sure it will expand into many much more use cases. But yeah, fueling the curiosity of the kids makes it healthy. So thanks, thanks for explaining that. Um, so where are we currently in Evo in terms of, you know, app, have we launched it? Uh, 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 is, is it still in beta stage? Uh, can you tell a little more about that? Yes. Um, so we launched a product or our, our application Mellow on the 27th July. Okay. Uh, this year, it was a soft launch. So we did not really invest in any kind of crazy marketing or advertising or whatever. It was a soft launch because we said, okay, we have some kind of a healthy community already pre-built because we did a lot of curiosity uh, in the months before. And we just wanted to get the first users into the application to start analyzing behavior in the app so that we can start optimizing and improving the first things that we just haven't seen. So this was the stage that we had now for the last... 35 days. Um, now the product has reached a new level. So we use these 35 days to really ship a lot of optimization, a couple of redesigns, a couple of new functions. Um, they should be available with the next launch. And then we are segueing in really investing in advertising and promotion. So to build the awareness, the application right. is available right now in 12 countries. I think that in Croatia, even with the soft launch, we already ranked up to the top three in the Apple oh, charts, wow. um, which means that we've been just one place below Duolingo, which in, oh, in education, which means it's a lot. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot. So uh, I'm curious what stays, what, what is, what will happen in the next uh, weeks and months, because now we are really starting to, yeah. Got think it. about so, communication and i'm assuming at this point you would you would not uh, have you started the subscription and for now it should be is it free or you have already put it under it, subscription it was freemium so um we we offered it as a free version for everyone and people could then segue into paid so that we see how do the people segue into paid um and now we are completely shifting over to a paid version full paid version Oh, wow. with, with trials. So you need to try it out. And uh, so everyone catch the application for free. And I think uh, the period that we are offering is more than enough to understand, okay, is this something that I see valuable for myself? Got yeah. it. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. So may, a few hundred or maybe thousand users would have tried by now? Seven, thousand, seven and a half thousand active, monthly active users is currently what we see in the app. Oh, which is very good. I mean, uh, yeah. at this time, which is pretty good to see and you would have got validated. Also, I mean, while monetization is pretty simple in what you would have you do, a uh, premium type of thing, I, yeah. I like the fact that you are already moving there. So if there is value, whatever cohorts you develop are the ones who, who you know are finding value in it. Exactly. Uh, yes. Also, just one thing here. So from idea and sometime 2022 to 2024, right? Also, mm -hmm. uh, starting with maybe the first co-founding team, what's the team size today? How many team members do you have totally? So in total, we are now, uh, I think, more than 15 daydreamers in total. 15. And this is then 15, yeah. Yeah. One interesting question. I read about your LinkedIn part. Um, you all are based in different uh, countries, cities, etc., right? So this is, this is uh, fully remote. Mm -hmm. Do you think it works uh, when you are... Um, 
when you're just starting, there is so much to do. Uh, you know, it's kind of evolving every day. Uh, does it work uh, in the zero to one journey to have this team in remote? Would you suggest that, or would you say that if it's possible, you know, uh, you would suggest going for a one city type of team? Oh, that's a very good question, and I was also thinking about it several times. And there have been moments, being super honest, where I said, "Oh, I think it would be better that we have all the people in one place." But on the other side, um, just thinking about the world where we live and the opportunities that we have with being connected with each other. Um, I think there is so much good talent around the world um, and we should not lose the opportunity to lose good people and good talent just because of locations. So that's, that's my thinking so far. Uh, it is challenging. Definitely. It's challenging to get people or set up a team if everyone is somewhere else. Uh, but it's also one of the, possible. You just need to focus a little bit more on um, the recruitment in the beginning and filter out very heavily. Um, and um, yeah, that's it. It's, 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 I think it's trial and error. So you need definitely to, to calculate in a bit trial and error uh, here. But as I said, it's working, it's possible. Focus just on a lot of these recruitment things in the beginning. So Got to it. avoid any kind of conflicts later. So I also feel you're right in a way, recruitment, the way you work, uh, right. maybe async communication, documentation, few of these things, right? If you manage it pretty well, uh, then, 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 you know, uh, work from home uh, is still possible. But if you do not find those, like, you know, there's written communication is not that strong, then those type of things can actually uh, be a problem. Also, uh, I feel in today's world um, uh, there are uh, so many things right so many problems to solve when you're solving for product when you're solving for few things right it's it's always important to keep the momentum going and maybe i know this is a problem to be solved someday but uh, at least keep moving ahead that's something that has to happen so that's the reason i feel that as long as your product is moving in the right direction and you have, you know you're you're making progress that momentum should not be lost for things like this Maybe there is one good advice that I can give uh, to everyone. Yeah. So one thing that was significant, I think, why we are here where we are now with this amount of people and still everyone is happy and still everyone is working together. Um, I mean, the lucky thing that we have, that we have five founders and every founder has something like his specific skill set and this one niche where he's just, just focusing on this. So what I try to do is I, I try to build the people around the, the, let's call it the knowledge hubs. So if there is my engineering founder and uh, my other technical founder, so both of them are sitting in the city, then I still try to get the rest of the team somehow around them because what we try to do is at least on a monthly level to have these human things where they go together out for a dinner or whatever. This is really making a big difference. And we also already managed it and it was a very hard investment, but it paid out is uh, there was this one week in this year where we get together all on one place. So from Germany, from Romania, from all the cities in Croatia. And this this really changed the the vibe in the team, the culture. Totally, totally with you. I, I in fact that's the post I saw. I actually gave it a good thought, right? If I'm in your position, because to me that is very interesting. Uh early days capital also is very, you know, limited, right? Mm -hmm. Even a small travel stay can be something that whether you can afford or not you don't know right so but not doing it also has a lot more in terms of cost sometimes if you don't do it right you do not see probably the small friction the lack of motivation to take another initiative to go you know probably you have done 10 things but still to do 12 things that extra motivation sometimes come because people have met each other they get get energy from each other in a way right so uh, I, I kind of understand why you say that it, it was uh, it's working that way and the knowledge of part you mentioned. Great. Mm -hmm. Coming on the capital part again, have you raised any funds? Uh, uh, how have you been managing your finances? Because I understand this is the content model takes some time before you can monetize it to make it a profitable business, but it will take some time. So how have you been managing the finances? <clears throat> so I think the initial injection that we uh, needed was um, mid-2023. Uh, when we then started to have the first investments that we have to do. So for we outsourced building an, uh, the web websites and all these things. So 
uh, when we had these first initial investments that are heavy that are outside of the company and the skill set of the founding team, we said, okay, we need to raise. And uh, this was the classical FFF, so friends, family, fools. Um, in, in our case, it was a friend of two of us uh, in Germany who is a business owner who helped us with the first injection so that we could start kicking off everything, hiring the first people. And uh, then we, um, yeah, invested a lot of time, uh, a lot of time in getting in touch with big VCs or strategic corporates that could be a fit for us. And uh, I really have to say it's a it's a hard game outside there. So it's not that easy. It's really a tough one, um, especially in Europe. It's very challenging, super challenging to get to any kind of pre-seed investments. And um, we ended up with business angels uh, to move forward. So they helped us with something like our kind of pre-seed round, which helped us to then run the entire 2024 year. And now we're having an extension so that we can also run 2025. Um, but I just want to say one thing. So first of all, you can't start early enough with these kind of conversations. So you should start with them immediately when you say, okay, if you decide this is what I want to do, Give yourself two weeks to clean everything up, make your plans, prepare your communication, and then kick off with this. Uh, it takes uh, much longer than ever before to get anyone convinced to get investments. That's the first thing. And the second thing is um, we would not be here with this idea, with all the innovation and all the cool functions, if we would not have had all these kind of um, conversations with venture capital companies or big corporates uh, that gave us something like a no, maybe, but they gave us a feedback. And honest feedback. And this helped us to then think a next level and come back and say, okay, let's increase. Let's make it bigger. Let's make it better. And it's a learning process. So it's, it's, these people will give you really good feedback if they give you feedback. And um, you should never stop getting feedback in the first two or three years. Well, look, this is very interesting insight as well. In fact, that's an advice. Uh, thanks for sharing that. Uh, sometimes, you know, people say investors, VCs, right? All that is just for your validation, etc. But when, sometimes when you talk to them, right? Because they see the industry, they see the macro market. Uh, they keep giving, you know, few are obviously, right? There are few of those who just demotivate you. Just keep that noise aside. But uh, it really helps you. Sometimes you start doing too many things, right? As an entrepreneur, we get any, oh, maybe I'm doing for kids of age six to eight years i should be doing for eight to ten ten to twelve this is a growing segment right whatever right so many things right here i'm focusing too much on the western countries the real growth is on asian countries i don't know right so sometimes they uh, they keep they keep keep you rooted and those conversations act as a feedback as a as well as a reality check so mm -hmm. uh, i i think good point that you raised funding will happen or not is dependent on many many things right also i feel you are right. Just start. Take it as a sales process. Keep doing it on site because sometimes it's very important. If you have to get talented team, you need capital. So that will happen. But the feedback part is equally important. Thanks. Thanks so much for sharing that. I think it's it's a perspective sometimes people miss on um, in the day to day hustle. But it's it's a good perspective to have uh, nonetheless. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now. Uh, coming on that part, actually, right. So just one more thing. Do you also feel this? In the life of an entrepreneur who is just, you know, starting early days, this plays a role as validation. You get into an accelerator, you get a PR article, you get VC funding or not. This validation kind of helps them to validate or is it just a lot of noise? People should just focus. What do you think about the whole small, small, this validations or, you know, funding happening or not happening, getting into accelerators, et cetera, et cetera. No, that's a very good question. So, uh, I mean, look, as I said, we, we had the luck that we have the diversity in the team so that I could really, as a CEO, take a lot of focus on exactly what you mentioned. So I was focused on all these noisy things. So getting in touch with accelerators, getting in touch with incubators, uh, pitching uh, in front of angels and VCs, corporates, thinking about strategic partnerships, expansion partners. So... Um, there was, I had the time and energy to really build this entire go-to-market VC PR strategy thing. And um, then also to, to say, okay, now it's built, but now let's also get it. You need to get things signed. You need to get the deals done. And um, 
I also really have to say, uh, I was always part of the business development in most of these organizations where I worked. So I think nowadays a, a, a really serious CEO needs to have these kind of level of skill sets. So especially in sales, it's a sales job 100% for the first years because you're selling yourself to everyone. But again, everything helped. So there was not one event where I was not coming back home where I met new people, a new network, and at least got a new introduction to something which maybe on the long run has created a lot of value for us. So networking and building your lobby, as, as we would say, is really super significant. It's, it's huge. It's huge. In, in, in this new world, where the VCs are not just throwing money on the, in, in the market, you need to build an ecosystem a heavy, strong network of people that like you, that want your product to be there, or that ideally have a personal interest in the product for something else uh, that will help you to open these very heavy doors now. Got it. No, that makes a lot of sense. Also, I feel uh, playing to a strength, you, uh, if you have co-founders who are focused on, let's say, marketing, technology, product, etc., one of you could actually take the role of reaching out. In fact, I must say at your stage, Yours is the most recognized um, brand, I would say. At a very early stage, you know, I could see the PR around something here, there. Also, you got the benefit, as you only mentioned, right, in Croatia at least. Because mm -hmm. somehow, right, through the network, through the through the circles, through the small, here and there, some hacky stuff that you have done, right, uh, you could get the users and that actually comes out of, you know, now these users are helping you build the product, right? You get the feedback faster and that overall improves. So, uh, I, I can relate, in fact, to this. And this is actually a good hack for anyone who is in zero to one stage, right? If you have the bandwidth, if you can take out or make that bandwidth, do network and reach out, uh, raise hands. Uh, a lot of people help as well So in, in, in this phase. So just raise yeah. hands and probably, uh, you know, it might help uh, the startup. So I, I, one, one very quick tip and hack for everyone who's currently starting. So what I did, um, and I mean, it really paid off is, Focus on all conferences and events that are connected to your industry that you are addressing or the target group and the, uh, the field that you're addressing. So we went to a couple of incubators. We, are, we, we luckily won. So the best business case 2024 was the one in Croatia and the best, most innovative media startup in, uh, in Germany. So this is, these are big recognitions. Uh, in the next two months, we are again on eight conferences pitching in the finals. So this is what you need to do because getting into these kind of conferences and um, contests is not that heavy, uh, but it's helping you. It's helping you to, again, get network, meet people, train your pitch, get the feedback that you need. And um, nowadays, it's not that hard to find them. So just open ChatGPT if you need and ask it, hey, this is my industry. This is my target group. Send me a table with all the conferences and pitch conf whatever popular things. List it up, and then you have a list. And then block yourself two days. Send all these applications out, and the the rest is luck and magic. That's my hack. No, thank you so much for sharing this. Sometimes you know we call it hustle, we call it growth hack. Really, if you ask me, right, it is all about as you mentioned. Sometimes shooting in the dark, but you have to keep mm -hmm. trying. You cannot just leave it right that hey, it's not working or this is not something I am going to do. <laughs> yeah, awesome. So, uh, what are the plans? Uh, I know where we are. Uh, we just launched one month back, thirty-five days. Good validation. Uh, what's the plan for next one year and next three year? Um, or, or is three year too too way ahead uh, for now? And you probably have one year plan. Which your way? What's the target? Uh, no, we have we have a three years plan so far. Uh, everything else would not make sense because of the technology change. Technology is too quickly changing right now. Um, so from a, from a growth point of view, by the end of this year, we want to get to 100,000 monthly active users. This would be the goal, okay. um, which is super realistic if we continue doing everything what we do. And um, from a product, I mean, this is the one year goal. My three years goal would be minimum 1 million uh, monthly active users on the platform. Um, from a product point of view, we are focusing more and more now on improving the level of how AI can hyper engage, hyper increase, hyper innovate, hyper interact and hyper personalize everything that we do. So we are making a big bet on this. And um, we have, as I said, a couple of these new features and assistants that are in the pipeline already. And uh, my very big bet for the three years, 
this is a very big part, is that hopefully we by then can not just have a phone device, an application that is only usable by smartphones or tablets, but that we can really come out to the industry with a with a dedicated physical device. Yeah. Good. That was a great conversation. Uh, I learned a lot uh, in this conversation. Also, you know, uh, so many good points, insights you have given about the industry, how it's growing. Uh, there is competition, may not be direct and, and so on. Also, the way you are looking to build products and the advice that you have given in between around hiring, uh, around, you know, being shooting in the dark, right? Going to conferences, building the network. Those are really, really uh, helpful. I'm sure somebody who is going to build, who's listening to this conversation, thinking, right, probably where you were in 2022, I have an idea I want to build, can pick fewer, few of the uh, few of the insightful ad advices that you have given and, and build it from there. Is there anything else that you would like to add um, uh, to this beautiful conversation? Um, maybe just to make it round thing also, because thank you, first of all, for the invite. Um, and... Um, uh, I mean, there is a reason why we are here. Uh, we are also uh, using CleverTap in our application. And uh, as you know, I, I'm from a data world. So I'm someone who loves data. And um, just also one thing for anyone starting there, don't forget your data and your data strategy. It's super relevant for everything, everything you do. And especially if you start thinking about any kind of investors, data is great. And um, yeah, that's the last thing I want to say. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, totally agree with you. I'm, I'm in the business of data insights and, you know, uh, helping exactly. with engagement. So uh, totally with you. So, so happy uh, to see uh, the product launch happening. So happy to see, uh, you know, doing uh, you doing beautiful stuff. I still feel if there is anyone from design, anyone who is in zero to one stage, they should definitely go to your website. Uh, can you spell uh, how, how can they check the website? It is one of the most beautifully designed, most beautifully designed website that I have come across. If you can spell it for us. Thank you. So yeah, you can see the website if you Google uh, Tales of Mellow, Mellow with two L, uh, dot com. So Tales of Mellow dot com. And yeah, yeah. enjoy the website. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nivea, for your time. You have a great do and keep hustling, keep building. Thank you so much.